All right, we're live here on Apologetic Showdown. I'm here with Jordan and Chris, and they're going to be debating the existence of God. I'm going to let them both introduce themselves, and then we'll go ahead and get started, and it'll just be open dialogue. So, um, Jordan, you want to go first? Yeah, okay. It's a pleasure to be back here. It's a pleasure to meet you, Chris. Uh, happy to be here debating the existence of God. Uh, my name's Jordan. I'm a physics student, but also interested in philosophy. And uh, I'm just looking forward to discussing God's existence here. Well, I'm, I'm, at youth, I'm at Youth Physics on Twitter. If you want to go check out my Twitter after this debate, you think I did well or whatever, but I probably won't. But. So I'm Chris. I am interested in philosophy, theology, a bit of physics, but mostly philosophy, metaphysics, abstract objects specifically, which is why we're discussing this argument. And thank you, Dry Apologist, for having me on. And I'm looking forward to this debate because this is one of my favorite arguments. And I'm not I'm not an expert philosopher, obviously, but this is a debate that I've written about and it's one that I'm very passionate about. So I look forward to debating it. All right. Sounds good. So we'll start the clock uh, about 45 minutes or so, see how things go. And then definitely if people have questions, I'm going to put them in the live chat and then hopefully I'll have time to field some of those. So I'll go ahead and start it off with Chris. So go ahead and present the argument starting now. So this argument starts by establishing the realism of abstract objects. And the different abstract objects that we're talking about specifically in this argument are mathematical truths, propositions, possible worlds, and universals. And there are different individual arguments for each subset of abstract objects. For There are a couple arguments for universals, abstract uh, mathematical truths, propositions, etc., that really take aim at the specific nature of each abstract object, right? There aren't really general arguments necessarily, but I'm going to defend a few of them on here for each one. I like to start with what's probably the most obvious argument for the most obvious subset, which is mathematical truths. And that is the fact that mathematical truths, mathematical laws generally are necessarily true. For example, that two plus two equals four, that five minus three equals two is necessarily true. It's not something we could alter, it's not something we can change. And it was also true far before any human was able to, let's say, abstract that from the material world, when we were able to understand that. It was something that was necessarily true, completely independent of us. And if the universe had never existed, the physical universe, that is, then I see no reason why two plus two would not, at that point, equal four. It's a truth that is independent of material and mental reality. And from that, one can deduce that the numbers of the objects within that truth are themselves necessarily existing. Because you couldn't have the truth 2 plus 2 equals 4 if there was no 2. So if one were to postulate, okay, 2 plus 2 equals 4 is true, but 2 doesn't actually exist. This is evidently incoherent, as you couldn't have 2 plus 2 equals 4 without the 2. So if you're going to admit that 2 plus 2 equals 4, for example, is a necessary truth, which it evidently is, then you also have to admit the actual reality of the objects that constitute these mathematical statements. Next is the argument from the nature of propositions. And a proposition is a statement about the natural world or really anything that is independent and separate from the particular sentence that it's stated in. For example, the statement, John is an unmarried man is, the, is an identical proposition to John is a bachelor. The sentence, the words are different, but the proposition is identical. Same with the English sentence, snow is white. And the German sentence, she is the vice. They're the same propositions, even though they're different sentences. And regarding the nature of propositions, particular propositions independent of what happens in a certain situation or whether certain things exist are true. For example, the sentence, John Wilkes Booth killed Abraham Lincoln would be true even if tomorrow everything went out of existence. That proposition would still be true. And even if nothing existed, there was no material reality at all, there was no material reality at all, the statement, the proposition, 
there is no material reality would still be true. So under any circumstances, some propositions are going to be true. And next is the argument for the existence of possible worlds. And now I wanna be clear that I'm referring to logically possible worlds in this case. But what makes something logically possible is to not have a contradiction. So if a sentence, even though it seems physically impossible, naturally impossible, or metaphysically impossible, is still logically possible if it does not entail a contradiction. And whether a possible world or concept entails a contradiction is independent of the physical reality that exists or the minds that entertain them. The fact that an unmarried bachelor is a logically possible idea, for example, does not, re does not require that I entertain that or realize that it's incoherent. Likewise, logically possible worlds don't depend on the fact that people realize that they're possible or understand that they're possible for them to be possible. So because of that, we can deduce that logically possible worlds are completely independent of any material or mental reality. And lastly is the argument for the existence of universals. And there are a few from this, but I'm going to focus on two. One of them is the argument from the one above the many which is that whenever we see instances of particulars which exemplify a universal, none of these particulars are the universal, if it exists. They are just instances of it. So because of this, all the particulars that we see, if they were to, say, just drop out of existence, they just blink out of reality, the universal would still exist, since none of these particulars are the universal itself. The universal is something that is exemplified. It's not something that is the object itself. It's independent of it. And from there, there's also the problem of incoherence with rejecting the existence of universals. So let's say that somebody denies that there are any universals. There's the problem of how we can communicate if there's no universals, if there's no objective concepts or knowledge that we can both entertain that are instantiated in particulars in our minds. So if there's no universal, let's just say logic or idea, concept that we're both entertaining, then how is it possible that we both understand each other, that we're able to communicate? And so though those are the main arguments that I find compelling for the existence of abstract objects. And from there, this I'd say is probably the easiest part of the argument where one considers different forms of realism. For example, there is Platonic realism, which is that abstract objects exist in their own Platonic realm, this third realm, separate from if you believe that the mind isn't physical, you have the, the reality of the mind, the reality of physical objects, and then the reality, the realm of abstract, object, of abstract objects. And then there's Aristotelian realism, which essentially argues that universals are within the objects themselves and as universals, we abstract them from the objects. So when I see something that is red, the universal red is in the object, but it exists as a universal separate from the instantation as an idea in my mind. And lastly, there is scholastic realism that holds that ultimately, all of these abstract objects are contained in the divine necessary intellect. But it doesn't deny that the Aristotelian analysis of abstract objects is also true. They are in fact found in physical objects, such as this tape measure. The universal of green is exemplified and it is in this tape measure, but ultimately it lies in the mind of this divine necessary intellect, even though it can have proximate existence in the material objects around us. So it affirms the truth, the truth of part of Aristotelian realism but denies that it only lies in these objects. It also adds the fact that these abstract objects ultimately lie in the divine necessary intellect. And so from here, one can argue as I choose to that Aristotelian realism Platonic, and Platonic realism are both incoherent and are therefore not satisfactory accounts of the existence of abstract objects. For example, there are the numerous problems which have been addressed by many philosophers in the past about Platonic realism. Because one of them is that these objects aren't existing in something that somehow interacts with the material realm. 
the they exist according to platonic realism in their own world you could say of abstract objects that is completely separate from the material and mental realms and this raises the problem of how exactly would they interact with the world how are we able to know them if they exist in their own platonic realm if they aren't somehow in material objects how can we abstract them and understand them if they exist in their own platonic realm and there's also the problem of how they can cause differences in the world and an example of this is how we can build architecture according to certain shapes and certain forms which obviously impacts the world around us and if platonic realism is true then it's incomprehensible how we're able to do this how these forms are able to interact with the world even if it's in the context of a, of a particular part of material reality and lastly there's the issue that if they exist only in the only in this abstract realm then they aren't exactly existing in anything at all like green doesn't actually exist in this or there's no form of human there's no it essentially from an epistemic phenomenal perspective denies that universes exist because if for example green and all these other universals that we can understand and that we find that we apprehend particulars of them in our waking lives if they exist if these abstract objects really exist in their own platonic realm unconnected from us then to us they don't even exist because we can't interact with them they aren't in anything they just simply aren't there and so then it becomes completely pus puzzling and incoherent how we could possibly apprehend them if they exist in their own realm or how they can cause effects in the material world. So these two or three objections make platonic realism an incoherent and untenable position for the realist to take. So next is Aristotelian realism, which claims that these abstract objects, such as universals, are contained in material objects, but are abstracted as immaterial abstract realities by the mind. They are contained in our intellects. But the problem with this is namely that it also faces the problems of nominalism or conceptualism, that these truths, these abstract objects, simply exist independent of material reality and are mind, contingent human mind, independent. So to claim that the color red exists in these material things, but not in other, not anything else. It only exists in these material things. Then that also faces the problem that the arguments I put forth fought against. They are, to no pun intended, they are universal. They exist outside of the material or mental realm. So the Aristotelian realism is ultimately just another form of conceptualism or nominalism. They exist in their material realm, but not independent of it, which the arguments that I put forth, I hope, are compelling enough to show that this view is false. And so Aristotelian realism, while it is correct in saying that these abstract objects exist in physical material objects and are abstracted by intellects, it is incorrect to say that they only exist there, that they do not have an ultimate source. And that leaves us with the view that Edward Fazer dubs scholastic realism that while these abstract objects are in material objects and we can't apprehend them, we can abstract them, ultimately they lie in a divine insight, the divine mind that contains all of these truths, the truth is mathematics, possible worlds, universals, et cetera, et cetera. And this view is the only one that doesn't face any problem of incoherence. And since the others have been ruled out, it leaves classic realism that abstract objects exist approximately in physical reality, but ultimately in the divine intellect as the only tenable option for the realist, which in regards to abstract objects is the only tenable position. And that's my argument. Well, that was, uh, that was very impressive. That was very impressive. Thanks. Um, now, for the most part, for the, for the latter half of the argument, at least uh, the image that, uh, I, that I sent you on Twitter, the latter half seems to me to be w without problem. I really don't see a problem with the latter half. My issues lie with the with the first half of the argument, and that's uh, realism. Yeah, re realism, nominalism, conceptualism. I take a 
I think that there are at least a few coherent nominalist approaches to abstract objects. Most of all, universals. It's the one that I'm most that I'm most familiar with. Um, no, I think that the th that three coherent nom nominalist approaches to, to universals, at least, as as far as I know, uh, you know, like like you said, I am definitely not an expert either. But the three nominalist approaches that I do find attractive are class nominalism, class nominalism, resemblance nominalism, and trope theory. Um, so class nominalism, um, as I'm sure you know this, but it says that, uh, that universals are uh, classes or sets and that we, when we refer to some properties such as redness or roundness, we refer to the class of the set of red things. Um, rese resemblance nominalism, uh, according to resemblance nominalism, so properties are classes of resembling objects. So uh, the property of, of redness or the property of roundness or some other property such as tallness is any object has it as in virtue of just being a member of a class of such things that re resemble each other in that particular way. And the trope theory, which I find a little more attractive than the others, but I still, the others I think are coherent, it's a more extreme version of nominalism and it conceives as properties and relations as themselves as unrepeatable particulars. And in this view, universals don't exist. So for example, the the blueness of my eyes, or the height, the Eiffel Tower, uh, they are their tropes, which are uh, particulars. So in some versions of trope theory, ordinary objects, cars, trees, tigers, are composed of just of solely particulars. There is there is no there is no entity that is an, that is instantiated self-same identically in one object and another. So the red, the, the the property of redness, so the redness trope in the one billiard ball, is numerically distinct from the property of redness in another billiard ball. Although they are qualitatively identical, they are numerically distinct in having other properties, such as uh, you know, spatial temporal properties. One billiard ball might be closer to the yellow billiard ball than uh, the other red ball, and I. I think that these three nominalist approaches are coherent. I would be very interested in your objections to them, and we can get a little bit more into that. But I think I'll, I will leave the introduction to the two nominalist theories there uh, concerning universals. Uh, what exactly do you, do you, what are your objections to these? So I actually, the only one of these that I had prepared a response to was yeah. resemblance nominalism. Yeah. That things simply have resemblances, right? There's no universal, they just kind of resemble each other. Yeah. And so I think the problem with this is that wouldn't that make resemblance itself a universal? There are particular instances of resemblance and there's this yeah. universal concept of resemblance that is occasionally instantiated, right? And I believe Bertrand Russell pointed this out that you get a vicious regress. Right? Oh, that's resemblance. No, it's universal. No, well, that's just resemblance. Oh, that's universal, right? You have a vicious regress of trying to argue that this is just a resemblance. But in reality, that resemblance just becomes another universal. So in the end, you still haven't gotten away from the problem of universals existing. You've just put it back a notch. Yeah. No. I'm not sure that I, uh, that I do totally understand this objection. Because it seems to me that I've if, if we say that something has a, has a the, the two things have the property in, of, of redness and, and virtue of, rese of resembling each other in terms of colour, I, I, I don't understand exactly how that is universal. If you, I'm hoping you could maybe explain that to me. Well, I just don't understand how that is. You're talking about um, two different objects having the quality of red. Yeah, the, the, and in virtue of that, they, resem they have a resemblance. Well, it, de it depends on what you're referring to, because if you're either referring to my objection to resemblance or my defense of universals. So do you want me to show why they are universals or to kind of yeah. argue against? Um, so yeah, show them why they're universals. The ultimate, I think, reason that these things are considered universals 
rather than just different instances of certain things is because ultimately I think I think there's an incoherence problem with nominalism about how we can communicate, how we can think, right? If there are no universals, for example, the word red is a universal. One could say words are universals. If another person utters red, that's a different instance of red. Mm -hmm. And to say that these things are just resemblances among different items raises a problem when it comes to classification or if you take an Aristotelian metaphysical approach, forms. But why these things have intrinsic causal powers or natural teleology, that is the same among different things. So for example, for me to say that both the Incredible Hulk and grass is green instead of just resembling each other, is that it's almost a tautology because they're almost, I, in a way they're identical. Not completely, but when you talk about resemblance or universals, I think the reason we should consider them universals is because they both have this resemblance and this resemblance that they have is not reducible to the thing itself. They are not that thing. And because of that, that's why they're universal. That's why they're ultimately not just material objects. Because I have a, um, I have a pencil here that is green and this green part of this tape dispenser. And I could just say, oh, they resemble each other. But if I were to destroy both of these things and everything that was green, greenness would still exist. It wouldn't just be completely destroyed. It's not completely reducible to these material things. And unless it is, then, then you'd be able to argue coherently for the resemblance theory. And there's also, like I said, if you just say two things are resembling each other, different things resemble each other in different ways. And so that means that each resemblance is a particular, it is an instance of the universal, which would be resemblance. So there's that problem and the argument that I raised earlier. So yeah, those are my okay. two contentions. There was one thing that I, that you mentioned there, and that was that the 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 green of the of the of the incredible Hulk and the green of the grass that they don't just uh, re resemble each other; that they are really are universals of the very same instance. But it seems to me that. That, that 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 just isn't true because they have different different properties. The, I mean, perhaps the Hulk is, uh, isn't isn't a good example. Maybe if I, if I take two two particular green objects, which are which are both in the actual world, they 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 aren't I get, uh, they aren't identical certainly in all the properties. They have different spatial temporal properties. One you know, for example, your green pen and the grass outside are have different spatial temporal properties. They are at different places in space and time, right? So it seems seems to me that that shows that they aren't they aren't identical. So the what we are seeing is a is a resemblance, right? Which when we say that they are both green, we are seeing that they are the they are the, oh, I met two members of a class or a set of things that resemble each other in this particular respect. So you know, it doesn't seem that they are the same instance, or the, the, the same thing instantiated in those two things, right? Does that, does that make sense? It does, but because we're talking only about the quality, the universal of being green, we're not talking about any other aspect of the object, just the instant, instantiation, however you pronounce it, yeah. of greenness. So for example, green in the Hulk, and green in the grass, even though they're located in different, well, Hulk doesn't exist, but like, even though these things are located in different places, even though they have different qualities, that works with the fact that they are particulars. They still share something in common. And that's instant, tried it again, didn't work. But in these different things, right, that's why they're different, because they're particulars. But we find these things that are, like I said, they cannot be reduced to the material they sell these resemblances that are just that are in the object but aren't reducible to it and are separate like i said from these spatio-temporal properties like greenness the fact that they both have the property of being green doesn't follow it doesn't follow that 
even though they're both green, the fact that they exist in different places means they're not a universal. There's, they still both have the quality of being green. They still both have that resemblance. So even if you said, oh, their other qualities are different, well, they're still both green. So I'm not sure if that exactly is what you're saying, but I think that's how I view the issue of the differences between the objects. Um, I mean, my, my view is still that The, the 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 property greenness that the, 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 for example between your your pen or the and, and the sharpener or the grass or the hulk is not the the it's not an instantiation of one particular identical property of greenness yeah. right they they are they're, because they're clearly not numerically identical they're they're qualitatively identical and, and they resemble each other and I think we can understand we can understand this through resemblance nominalism but you know the it's not a universal, is what I'm trying to say. Right. But so even if I were, even if we were to adopt that view, which I think is, I think that one is tenable against my earlier argument. I think that works until there's a problem with the fact that if you have a resemblance between two things, yeah. that is itself universal. So for example, my pencil and my tape measure are both having a resemblance and a two books having the same red cover or having the same color on the front page, they resemble each other too. So resemblance is instant is instantiated wow. in different cases. So you still have um, universals in that case. And there's also, I think, a big problem, which is the inco is the coherent problem. So how we are appealing to certain universals such as logic, reason, things like that, that are instant, instantiated in our minds that we are able to communicate. And if there was no objective universal standard to which we can appeal to, then it doesn't make sense that we're having this conversation, talking, right? If there right. is no yeah. universal knowledge or idea that we are both entertaining. Right, okay. Right. So the the two objections there that uh, you mentioned, if I understand them correctly, the first was that resemblance is itself a universal, and the latter was how can we uh, how can we really communicate about greenness if it's not we're not we're not talking about uh, the very self same thing, you know, if we're not talking about universal. Um, okay. The, 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 I think the first one, the resemblance. Is itself a universal? No, that 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 is that, that is quite interesting. But I, th I think that it, if we considered the resemblance between between any two things or between any set of things or class of things to be its own particular as well, such that the re the, the resemblance between any two things is not is not uh, n numerically identical. Between, uh, uh, not numerically identical to the resemblance between any other things. That may be able to solve it. Now, I've not thought of that before, so when I watch this back, I might realise that I'm talking complete nonsense, but I'm interested in what you think about that. That resemblance itself could be a particular, and, and, and each, in any case of a resemblance between uh, any set of particular any other set of particulars that resemblance itself is different than the resemblance and other between other, another set of particulars yeah and i think that's probably the best objection to resemblance nominalism right that you still have universals and there's also the issue of communication but so do you have any contentions with realism regarding possible worlds Mathematics or propositions. Right. Um, yeah, so maybe going to propositions. Um, although I think my answer to propositions may also bring up another one of your obje uh, the, the, the objection you just raised there, which is the 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 challenge of communication. I mean, so I think that propositions can be understood in terms of uh, I, I take a conceptual approach to it. Propositions are. Uh, ideas in the mind, and they're not—they uh, don't have any proper on, on 
existing ontological status. Um, so when we the the object of uh, of a truth value would apply to the the idea and the mind rather than the, the sentence, because like you say, uh, two sentences which contain uh, which are which are worded differently can mean the same thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, the the uh, just a the mental image can really do the same job. You said the mental image. Um, yeah, uh, an idea, which is would be the, the the meaning of a sentence. Right, and I think that's how we generally understand a proposition. You know, like when we hear it from different sentences, we get this conceptual notion that allows us to apprehend propositions. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. But as as far as I understand, propositions are understood to be to exist out, outside the mind as well, such that if there were no people, there would still be propositions. Yeah, I, because even if I never thought that, if, for example, there, like, like I said, the, I believe I mentioned earlier that no material reality exists. It's just nothingness. Like the nothingness that Craig talks about in the Kalam, just nothing, right? So if we have that nothingness, it would, the proposition nothing exists would still be true nothing material exists that would still be a true proposition that proposition would still exist because if it didn't then it wouldn't be true uh you know i'm not sure i think i have two main problems with that the first is that idea of nothingness that craig talks about i don't think that it's the I don't quite understand how that really is a coherent view for there to be nothingness, because surely if there was nothingness, then th there would be something, right? There, um, that that could be nonsense, but it's, it's it's my first impression. The latter is that I mean, a, 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 prop, a proposition is true if it it reflects the way the world is, but if there truly is nothing, then there is no way that the world is, and so that that proposition can't be true at all. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So maybe that particular example wasn't exactly correct because I, I don't think that's the only one where it works. That's just an example yeah. I thought of. Yeah. But what about, for example, of the John Wilkes Booth example that I gave, where even if everybody went out of, out of existence tomorrow, if all of material, physical things did, right? And so obviously I believe abstract objects would still exist, but all material things just went out of existence. That proposition would still be true. That proposition would still exist. That he was, Lincoln was killed by Booth. Even if there was nobody to enter, entertain it, it's still existent, mm -hmm. existent outside of material reality and outside of human minds. Now, of course, in this case, it's contingent and it's true because it actually happened in reality and that isn't necessary, you know, but it's still, like I said, it doesn't need to be entertained. It doesn't need to be confirmed in physical reality consistently to exist. It's independent of us. And that's why I would say it actually exists. It's not just something that we come up with. It's not conceptualized. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think that's a better example. But I, you know, I do still, I am inclined to disagree with it. I think that there, there, there is a, you know, I would like to make a distinction between what the, what the truth is and what the facts are. So I think, I think it would still be, it would still be, the case, right? That if if all of humanity were to disappear tomorrow, the history of the universe wouldn't have changed. It would still have been the case, you know, that that you know the X happened in the past. But it would. I don't think that it would. I would be inclined to say that it, it wouldn't be sense. It would be sensible to say that it was true that X happened because truth is a relationship between a between a proposition and reality, the way the world is. But if there are no people and the, the, there are no thoughts, there are no that then there are no propositions. And so there is no proposition X and to reflect the way the world is. The, the, the world's still there, but the propositions aren't. And so it, the proposition can't be true because it's, it's it's not there. That may be a bit of a radical view to take, but that might be very unpopular. But it, on first impression, it seems that way to me, at least. Oh, I think you've muted yourself. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I had myself on mute because there was some noise in the background. If I do that occasionally. Hold on one second. Yeah, yeah, no bother. Jordan, also, can you repeat that last thing that you had said? Because I, yeah, I'd rather yeah, hear it again. Yeah. So what I was saying that I, I would like to make a distinction between what the what the, what the truth is and what the facts are. So the facts are, yeah, the as the the state of affairs, the way the world actually is. But the, the truth is a relationship between a proposition and the way the world is. So. It would still be the, the, you know, the history of the universe would still have happened. X would still have taken place. But if any, if some, uh, you know, some proposition like uh, X occurred, if there, if the, tomorrow there were no people, that proposition wouldn't be true because there would be no such proposition. Because I view propositions as mental objects, and since there would be no people, there would be no mental objects, and thus nothing for the, no, nothing for. Nothing to correspond to the way the world is. Yep, Sadly, exactly. something has come up and I have to go. Oh, Which okay. is, yeah, I'm sorry about that. But like, so sad. because this is, it, it is. So maybe we could do this another time. Either continue this Absolutely. argument, or maybe talk about another one of Phaser's five proofs, which I think are very interesting, like the Neoplatonic proof, the Thomistic, Aristotelian, any of those, but. Yeah. This was a great conversation, and it's sad that we left right now because that was a great point that you made about reality and corresponding to reality. Yeah, and that's when I think I'll have to stew on. So maybe this is actually a good time to leave because now I won't be, get caught and backed up into a corner. I have to get time yeah. to think of a refutation or maybe accept it. So, sure. yeah, this like was it. a great conversation. We should do it Hopefully again. Sometime. Yeah, it was great. Thank you. Yeah, hope we can do it again. Thank you. Yeah, for thanks sure. for coming, Chris. And yeah, if you guys want to set something up again in the future, we can definitely do that. And then um, if anybody has any questions, I know there are a few comments. Um, and Chris, of course, you can go at any point, but go ahead and throw them in. in and then um, Jordan can address those. Um, the only thing I see so far was this one guy asked, does the existence of a place pre-exist the existence of God? I'm a little confused by this question. Yeah, me but too. This might, but if he's saying that, um, do these abstract objects exist before God or does God exist before them? I'd say it's a meaningless question because they're both necessary. God is eternal existing, he's completely necessary. And so are these objects, they're always existing in his mind and he is always existing. In order for a thing to exist, it needs a place to exist. Then that's, this is kind of what I was entertaining with the uh, scholastic realism that I was talking about and that I want to defend more, but. Yeah, a little confused by these questions, but yeah, well, I, <laughs> yeah. what I can best say, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, thank you for having me on. I apologize, I'd love to do this again. Love to talk to Findlay again, either about this argument or another, or possibly talk to someone else. But yeah, this was a great experience, and I look forward to talking to you guys later. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Thanks yeah, for coming great. on. Great talking to you. Really enjoyed it. Yep. All right, well, I don't want to, uh, um, and friends on the debate, so we'll go and end it. Unless, did you have any parting words or anything? Uh, no, no part much. Just uh, I enjoyed them, and uh, I hope that uh, I can talk to Chris again another time on your channel. Yeah, definitely. Really yeah, enjoyed so, being here. yeah, we'll try to set this up again. All right, well, I hope everybody yeah. enjoyed it, and hope they'll have a follow up. But all right, well, thanks for watching. Have a good night.